the Meta AI Summit and the panel today is on AI, the future of mental health and the role of digital therapeutics. Every 40 seconds, we lose someone to suicide globally. And this is deeply a tragedy of our times. And especially now with technology, one would think that we could solve this problem. Like I always say, we're super connected, but very lonely. So on the panel today, we have some amazing speakers. We have Dr. Deepak Chopra, obviously his vision for well-being and mental health. We have Dr. Srini Pillai, who is the leader when it comes to anxiety, looking at the role of uh, depression, mental health, also as a psychiatrist, and working with some leading technologies today. We have Michael Rouse, who is the CEO of X2.ai. We have the privilege of working with him on our own chatbot called PB. And we had over 3 million messages exchanged, 500,000 minutes of active conversation, and 3,800 plus suicide interventions. Then we also have uh, Wendy Wu, who is the founder of WonderTech, a uh, uh, leading startup in bio, in voice AI, voice biomarker enabled AIs out of Singapore. And then we have Sanjeev, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, who is uh, Highmark Technologies, Highmark Interactive, whose app got FDA approved for looking at mental health and brain injury. So let's get the conversation started, maybe with, firstly with Deepak, we'll do a round table. Everybody kind of sets their vision, their background for three minutes. But Deepak, can you share your vision for mental health and AI. Okay, I think it's very important to understand what the mind is and what emotions are before we understand how technology can intervene. The best definition of mind that I've heard comes from neuropsychiatrist uh, Dan Siegel, who says the mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information in an ecosystem of living beings. I like that definition very much. And uh, when we understand that, then there are two ranges of experience we have. One is we are disconnected from life. And that expresses itself as anxiety, which is the anticipation in the future, anger, which is the memory of pain in the past, guilt, which is blaming yourself, and ultimately hostility, shame, humiliation, and depression. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is empathy, compassion, love, joy, kindness, equanimity, and total loss of fear, joyful, energetic body, loving, compassionate heart, clear mind, and lightness of being. Given this range of human experience, it's not possible to monitor what you're going through, through, as you can see, through voice recognition, through facial expressions, through micro circulation, through eye movements, through body language and through gestures and intervene in real time. I'm not an expert in this, but I can guarantee you that in the next uh, decade or less, we'd be able to take a five second video of you speaking, predict what's happening in your body and intervene in real time. So that's my little insight for what it's worth. Thanks Deepak. Uh, Srini, what are your thoughts as a psychiatrist having worked in anxiety for decades? Uh, what are your what are your thoughts? I think my thoughts are mostly conflictual because I I'm not sure that I believe uh, that we should be addressing mental health through the lens of mental health. <clears throat> That's because I don't believe that the brain stops functioning at the level of the neck. I also think we're entering an era where we need to be think of thinking about things in a much more complex way. Uh, two of the technology companies that I've co-founded, Rule and Circa, are looking at anxiety not in isolation. But, but as it pertains to the rest of the body, you know, one of the things we know is that stress can lock genes, and in locking genes, it can open up pathways to cancer, heart disease, stroke, and neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and I think that machine learning and artificial intelligence can really help us address at least three things uh, really importantly. Firstly, the complexity of things, how the different aspects of our lives, of our diets, our mental states, our physical states interact. Secondly, I think that we can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to augment the intelligence of, of physicians who often have clinical intuitions. Uh, and thirdly, I think we can use um, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to help to personalize the interventions. Uh, but along the lines of what Deepak is saying, I think that my deep interest in cellular um, ideas and cellular activity and physiologic signals and biometrics stems from the fact that I think that these are still going to end up being correlational um, and that many of the questions that we need to ask lie outside of matter. Um, so overarchingly, I'm excited to think about a future of mental health where we recognize that 
the mind and the body, that the brain and the body are not disconnected, uh, that we can support the brain by supporting the body and vice versa, and that we can learn to become more sophisticated in the ways in which we predict mental states by understanding these connections. Thanks, Srini. Uh, Wendy, you want to go next? Yes, actually, I see this as an opportunity because it's first time in, I think, human history, accelerated by COVID, we, we really look, look into mental health and we actually are bold enough to talk about it. And uh, as an EQ expert, a master coach, my, my role has been helping people to understand uh, what emotions really about and how we optimize it instead of trying to, try to manage it. So I think what anxiety is trying to uh, ref uh, remind us is uh, what's our top strength as human being and uh, are we re really utilizing it? So the way I see this crisis is an opportunity for human being and AI to really work together um, by uh, by the the more openness of, of DA and, and in digital therapeutics. I think this is a great opportunity we actually empower more the experts in Psychiatry, in psychiatry, like uh, Dr. Pillay, like the spiritual leader, the development, uh, like Chopra, uh, the decades of hard work actually worked to help human beings to, to fight in depression and anxiety into a more digital form. That means AI will start to able to understand human being not as past behavior or gender or uh, just income, but actually understand our, how we feel as a person and our value and our purpose. And I think that's, that means this is the first time in history we can actually help AI be able to help human to leverage the biggest potential, meaning AI can also optimize its biggest potential. With, with the technology of voice by marker, we can understand our emotion real time. And also uh, with technology with active learning on the AI platform, this is, a, I think this is a great opportunity. AI can help us to not just live in your life, but more fulfilling in life. And together with human, not as a threat. Thanks, Wendy. So Michael, you know, we've been working for a while. So why don't you share your insights on mental health and the work you're doing with AI chatbots? Yes, of course. So for me, the journey really started as a patient. So over 15 years ago, I was a patient myself. And I realized that even though I back then lived in Europe and had free access to care and the best doctors in the world, it still uh, was hard to get actual access to care. So there's, there's nothing like 24 seven. It was like once every two weeks. Um, so there was just this big gap, I always thought. And um, Later, when I had overcome my own challenges, I, I became a peer support counselor. So I started helping friends and family members and coworkers also overcoming their struggles and talking through the things that they were struggling with. And what I realized that there's really this big gap in getting access to care where there's about one in five people, or according to the CDC, because of COVID even more, up to 40% people who need mental health support. And if you look at the statistics, there's simply only people available, trained professionals available for one in 50. So there's a huge gap. And luckily with telehealth, that's um, sl slightly made the gap a bit smaller, um, but still there's, there's a big gap. And, and this is something that in the morning, uh, Deepak was talking about this really like this concept of like a meta human where the human collaborates with the AI and in that way is able to instill their wisdom into the AI, and in our case, into the chatbot, then teach the chatbot to have the same conversations that you'd be having yourself as an expert, or that I would be having myself as a peer support counselor, and in that way, making sure that you can reach more people. And that's really what we did with um, with the project with the Chopra Foundation, um, focused on suicide prevention uh, with the Pee project. And um, yeah, it's just phenomenal to see how in that way, um, you can suddenly go from um, normally with an awareness campaign, just being able to inform people to actually helping them as well, and making sure they have conversations and, and tracking how much symptoms go down. And, and at the same time, like this really gets to huge numbers. So as, as Punacha mentioned, like 3,800 suicide situations de-escalated 
a hundred thousand people that have had conversations and have been chatting um, and got the support. And that's possible because the large scale conversations are happening um, through the, the automated chat. But as soon as we detect that there's some bigger need, some more need of a human touch, at that point, within 10 seconds, a human counselor takes over. So in that way, it's really this good partnership of instilling the knowledge into the system and also always have the backup there to be available at any time, 24 seven. Thanks, Michael. So I want to give uh, this a shot. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, can you hear us? Or can you share your insights on Hi, Mark, and the work you're doing when it comes to mental health. Thank you for having me, first of all, and hopefully uh, I can hear the conversation. It's been enlightening. Um, any luck on hearing what I'm able to say? You know, it's very faint, Sanjeev, unfortunately. Uh, but why don't you just, maybe just let's try for a minute and let's see what picks up. Yeah, so it never fails technology at a technology conference, but... Um, you know, I, I believe that now... More uh, more yeah, I think it's not working. It's actually having a lot of feedback. So why don't we try... I'll try to come back on Freud. Let me, let me try, let's try this again, yeah? But thank you again for all the work you're doing. Let's try to come back towards the end. Uh, I want to kind of move this conversation into uh, Deepak and really we look at mental health. So much of a mental health is stigma. And Deepak, you always said that people don't change with data. People don't really change that much insight. It is really for us to have inspirational storytelling. How can we look at mental health and what can we come up with new stories, and especially from a technology perspective, what can we learn? And you are a master storyteller, 92 books. You've inspired all, all of us. What can we learn? I think the most important thing to realize is that every human behavior, the end point is a feeling, is an emotion. The end point. Whatever we do in life, we do it to get a certain feeling. And those feelings are always in knowing our own emotions, in knowing the emotions of another, in managing relationships. So when I talk about emotional social intelligence, it means awareness of one's feelings, awareness of the feelings of another, also feeling the feelings of another, which is called empathy, but empathy is not enough. You need compassion, which is the desire to alleviate suffering. And interestingly enough, when you have the desire to alleviate somebody else's suffering, your suffering gets alleviated. So empathy leads to compassion and compassion leads to what we call love in action, which is what we're doing at uh, the Chopra Foundation with Never Alone, with PV, the chatbot and everything else. What came as a surprise to me was that people are more comfortable talking to a machine than to another human being because uh, they feel less vulnerable. They don't feel judged. And that was the genius of PV and her success. So given that, what I'm saying is we need a new story which says that my well-being is dependent on your well-being. Your well-being is dependent on my, my well-being. Everything that we're learning about artificial intelligence and its future is showing us that everything is entangled with everything. Matter, energy, information, consciousness, emotions, thoughts, images, creativity, it's all entangled. And artificial intelligence is taking us into our ability to actually uh, engage with this entanglement to everyone's benefit. So the new story will only come if we bring science, technology, academics um, into a new ecosystem where we include humanitarians, entertainers, storytellers, poets, songwriters, movie makers, educational people in the educational uh, world, all together, maximum diversity, shared vision, complementing each other's strength, open transparency, and the best use of technology to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. It starts with us. Personal transformation can lead to collective transformation. There's no social transformation without personal transformation. And if we have collective transformation, that original goal, the vision for a billion people, seeking expanded awareness of their own self and from there 
articulating a new vision for humanity, resurrecting a new story for humanity by resurrecting our collective soul. I think the work you're doing in this space, you know, you're tackling a, something that has such a chance to change individual lives and change them so much for the better. Uh, you know, uh, Michael, I'm, I'm particularly so inspired by the work you did uh, with your chatbot as well. And I know, Wendy, you're doing a lot in that segment of really kind of creating that kind of uh, kind of technology as well. I do, I, I do see a lot of other technologies coming into the market right now, especially around the chatbot space, which are being powered by AI in a way where they're being marketed as, especially to young people, as your AI friend, uh, your virtual friend, as well as a company that raised a significant amount of money recently as a startup to sort of track you in real life and take all of your data so that when you die, it can continue a chat relationship with all of your friends in a seamless way that you never die, right? And, and so I wonder to the relationship you see as people and chatbots become more and more intertwined in the next five, six years, are we gonna be living in a world where business models drive that engagement? So do you foresee a, a point where startups, which are focused on engagement, create such compelling chatbots that they even take the place of whatever a person could do with a real life human being. They become so immersive in such a level that they're not optimizing you to be the best you, they're optimizing you for the ad dollars, right? And, and what are the fears and things you think about as you build a company and really tackle, you know, how do I use this technology for good as it goes forward? And I'd start with, you know, Michael and Wendy, I'd love your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because ethics is really one of the most important things when going about building such a company because it's all about the trust that we have with the people we're trying to help and it, it all starts for me it starts with the mission so the, the reason i started this company was because i was a patient myself and i saw that i could help so many more people and that's really the the guiding point so so our our mission statement is aligned with that and we made sure that we have an ethical board and we also have published an ethical paper so we've published a paper combining different frameworks of the ethical standards of psychology with ethical standards of AI and combining those two frameworks to really set a high bar for the industry that we hope that everyone else will aspire to as well, to really make sure that we make sure that we always keep in mind what's the goal of the person we're trying to help and how do we make them feel better and achieve the goals that they have in their life. And in this way, it's like you said, also very important, like from business model perspective to think through how do we make sure that always stays aligned and how do we choose our partners in the right way that it always gets back to making sure we, we make the right impact. And, and for us as, as, a, as a company, as a startup, we also make sure that our investors are aligned with that. So we make sure that our investors are um, social impact investors. So that really for them, the, the end goal is to, to make a very big social impact rather than uh, certain other um, profit objectives. Thanks, Michael. Wendy? Um, so, at my uh, we are we are building a voice AI platform, which is the active learning voice platform, which actually requires the user to share a lot of data with us. And I think there are two things we're driving. The first, the first is ability to care. So with voice biomarker, the current technology within two to eight seconds will be able to understand your emotion and not just like your anxiety level, if you're happy or not. It's like 28 very different uh, specific ones. And uh, we, what we're doing now, we are empowering the whole ecosystem, not only the healthcare, traditional healthcare, but also the, uh, the telemedicine platform and also digital therapeutics and also the even the traditional healthcare hardware and to anything you can think of a mobile phone, the or the voice interactive places. People can understand. We try to answer one question is help people to understand if I'm okay. And a lot of people cannot distinguish. Uh, I'm just feeling down, or I'm, I'm clinically depressed. I'm, I'm feeling anxiety as emotion, or am, or am I going through anxiety attack? And with voice biomarker technology, we can help you to understand that um, you experiencing this as emotion, or you should go see a doctor, or you need suicidal prevention right now. So the first thing we're doing is uh, empower the whole technology with the ability to care as AI. 
And the second thing we're building, uh, which really drives me, is the foundation to trust. I think this is the very first time um, we actually, uh, as an ecosystem in all the, as a mainstream uh, media platform, no, sorry, AI platform, we can drive a new ecosystem. It's not driven by stickiness or conversion rate. I think sadly, a lot of the top talent in this world still drive this to metrics because of the traditional business model. We'd be able to drive a new business model is based on if really ha happier or healthier, and we can actually measure that. And uh, this, I think this is super exciting. And uh, with that trust, so it's more proactive from business perspective. We are driving this change instead of just reactive on legal perspective, because I don't want to be sued. And I think this this really make uh, this ecosystem more vibrant because we'll be able to. And I really highly agree what Chopper said. We need a lot of people, really uh, people in policy and in healthcare, in technology, in entertainment to tell a better story <laughs> to really make this happen. And I can't wait to realize that. Um, the birth of internet is to really empower everyone to live up to our potential instead of just stay forever online and buy more things and have more friends. Um, so I think with this too, uh, it's possible we actually make this uh, a better change <laughs> because it's a, the, the crisis foundation to, of trust and ability to care this technology. Thanks, Winnie. I think what you said is very important, right? So we always talk about the shared like, uh, uh, optimizing business models, driving outcomes, Absolutely. right? And it's time yeah. for look at new business models, transparency and trust. Mm -hmm. We are at an all time trust crisis in the world. People don't trust governments, religion, nation states, mm -hmm. and people trust people. And people, the lack of trust goes down. That's when we have suicide and all the crisis and mental health. I want to go to the next question. This is really for, I would say, for Srini and Deepak to kind of really riff on. Deepak always says, you know, the challenge is confusing yourself with your selfie. And uh, <laughs> so I think Srini, you know, you and Deepak talk about consciousness as a psychiatrist. Who am I? Kind of talk about from an anxiety, depression, give me your thought process and kind of maybe Deepak and you can kind of a conversation on this importance of knowing who I am and from mental health, what is the importance of that? Okay, but I do want to address very briefly the business models because I think we are also looking at new currencies, digital currencies, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and our current business models are, frankly speaking, uh, dependent on special interest groups and, uh, you know, big corporations. I think as we move into the future, we have to be aware that unless we democratize well-being and make it inexpensive and available to the whole world, we will go back to, again, what we call power mongering, ethnocentrism, cronyism, corruption, and manipulation. We don't want that to happen. Now, the difference between self and selfie, everything that we experience is a symbolic expression of the self. By self, I mean awareness. Artificial intelligence is a product of awareness, human imagination. So is everything. So once we understand awareness as fundamental reality and awareness as expressing itself as sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts as basic experience, qualia, a basic experience. There's no outer world, there's no inner world. There's only consciousness generating qualities of experience that we call qualia. Humans have the ability to create a story around the qualia, and that makes us the best storytellers, and that's the success. Humans tell stories. To be human is to have a story, but also not to recognize that the story is always provisional, always provisional, and it has context, meaning, relationship, archetypes, past memory, future imagination, as Srini said, it's very complex. So as we go beyond the selfie, which means our symbolic representation of ourselves as mind, body, and the universe, these are symbolic representations of awareness. And then we can actually harness the powers of awareness, even through technology. New stories, 
new imagination and even create new qualia experiences, new recipes, new flavors, new sounds, new textures, new, new colors, new shapes, new forms. We are embarking on an adventure that even Homer never dreamed of. Across the seas of inner space and outer space is a realm of possibilities that no one has ever imagined before. Thank you, Deepak. Srini, let's hear your thoughts. So I, I think I feel very synergistically with, with what Deepak described. So Rule that I'm the, the company that, that I'm with, which is I'm chief medical officer and co-founder, uh, is actually developing a virtual reality therapeutic platform with artificial intelligence uh, to help people rearrange themselves. Uh, and we also have a self-authored journey um, to be able to emphasize this notion of the self. So to get to the first part of your question, which is what is the self? Uh, I, I think probably the most influential person in my thinking about this has been um, someone named Ramana Maharishi, who says that really what we ought to do is to ask the question, who am I? without necessarily seeking a narrative answer. Um, and uh, I came across a metaphor recently, which I think describes this well, which is that if you think about uh, ourselves as constituting a, a movie screen um, with all of the characters and the, and the play being enacted, then the body and the emotions and all of these stories are, are the things that are projected onto the movie screen. And really what the self is about is that screen itself and learning to know that self. And I think learning to know that self requires both a potentially a different story and a non-story. Uh, the different story, I think, uh, has to do with the fact that the story of mental health is about how to fix things when you're broken down. Whereas uh, a Polish psychiatrist and psychologist, Kazimierz Dabrowski, talked about positive disintegration, which is that when we fall apart, there is a way in which we can put ourselves back together again. Uh, and so to a certain extent, I think, that we need to change the story that, that, that is being told around mental health. I think the second thing I would say about that is that when I think about uh, ways, the, the story, the story is the narrative and it's one way of reaching the self. Uh, we hear stories in scriptural testimony, for example. But as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali point out, scriptural testimony of the different ways of understanding things are probably a, a more basic form of understanding. There's inference, which is an intermediate form of understanding and then there's direct perception. And I think that digital therapeutics have the potential, together with artificial intelligence, to put people in touch with this direct perception of the self, which is metaphorically like what consciousness is, which is like the screen. Myself, thank you, Srini. So I think I'm gonna give this one more shot. Sanjeev, do we have you online? <laughs> okay, we can. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to have record Sanjeev's conversation and his vision. We'll kind of uh, stream it separately. Because I know with Highmark Interactive, we've had an amazing relationship and partnership over the years and more to be done. So I will definitely bring Sanjeev's conversation in. So with that, what I want to do... Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. It's great to meet you. Thank you. So Deepak, I want to kind of maybe do a, a, just a quick close, 30 seconds. Everybody, any closing comments starting with Deepak? Just that as long as we use artificial intelligence to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world, and keep that in mind, and we bring together the best minds in every field with maximum diversity and imagination, we have a very good future. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I was just thinking a bit more about the conversation we had before around ensuring the right thing happens for the people we're trying to help. And really what I'm hearing when I'm listening to Wendy's story and Srini's story and uh, what Deepak was talking about, it's it's the shift of really empowering the person. So empowering the person, giving them the tools, giving them the choice of different tools that they can pick from, which tool will help them empower themselves to achieve the goals that they aspire to achieve. Thank you. Wendy? I think this is an opportunity to really explore. Sometimes we forgot about how brilliant our mind is and as a decision-making tool. And it would utilize this crisis opportunity to help us to align our 
how we feel, our emotional being, our spiritual being, our value and purpose. And then just to have that integrated decision making process, empower that process with the AI. I think this is a great opportunity. We can really work together to to fight with this issue. Srini? I think my summary statement would be just to emphasize something that Deepak started saying, which was that I think in order for us to solve the problems associated with mental and physical health, we really have to focus pretty intensely on multidisciplinary teams. I think that medicine is a place where we can find the convergence of artists and scientists and technologists. And the more we can build teams like this, the more likely we are to be successful in really celebrating what the human condition is. Thank you, Srini. I think with that, I think I'm really excited to work with this team specifically. I think everyone, once again, we're launching, looking at launching Circa, we can look at your voice sample analysis, look at, look at stress analysis, working with Michael and his team, looking at AI chatbots and Deepak's vision for digital Deepak, and then Sanjeev with the work he's doing with, in, with brain injury and predict, looking at resilience. And uh, I think this is a, a dream team. And I, I look at the future of AI being really bright. And once again, I'm grateful for all your time and uh, look forward to catching up on our next conversation. And Thank before you, we everyone. end, I want to actually see if I can queue up something fun for Deepak. Let's see if I have that, uh, if it's going to play out. If I, I try to do it, let me see if it's over here. Maybe not. So as you're doing that, Punacha, I right. do want to say that we're also going to enter an era of health coaches mm -hmm. for just about everything. You know, right now, doctors don't have time to talk to patients uh, going through chemotherapy about their hair falling out or nausea or diabetologists don't have time to educate their patients with diabetes about the importance of sleep and diet and many other things. Digital coaches for health management in all these areas will become universal. Great. Great. With that, I think that's all we have. So thanks again and see you all soon. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank, Thank you all. You.